We're going to start a study today titled All That Jesus Taught. And the burden I have on my heart is to bring a balance in this matter of fulfilling the Great Commission. All Christians know how important it is to fulfill what is known as the Great Commission which Jesus gave to his disciples just before he left this earth. The first part of that Great Commission is found in Mark's Gospel chapter 16 and verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. But there's another part of this Great Commission, I call it the other half of it, which is described in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 to 20. And there it says, all authority, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, as I have observed Christendom and born-again Christians and Christian missions and Christian churches in the last 52 years since I was born again, I find that most Christians major on the Mark 16, 15 aspect of the Great Commission, and very few major on Matthew 28, verse 19. My guess would be 99% major on Mark 16, 15, and about 1% major on Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. So this is, uh, to use an illustration, it would be like 100 people carrying a log, and 99 people at one end of the log, and one person at the other end of the log struggling to hold that end up. That's the way I see it. So I found that the commission the Lord gave me when I began to teach the word as he gifted me was to emphasize that other aspect of the Great Commission, the one which is being fulfilled only by about 1%, whereas it should be 50-50. The first part of the Great Commission is what we know as evangelism and what's generally called missionary work, going out into unreached areas, very essential to bring the message of the gospel that man is in sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and Christ died for the sins of the world, he is the only way to the Father, Christ rose from the dead, and he who believes in him and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. But did the Lord want it to stop there, that once a person has believed, accepted the fact that he's a sinner, and received Christ as his Savior, is that all? What about Matthew 28, verse 19, where he said we are to go into all nations and make disciples. Now, what does it mean to be a disciple? Those early apostles who heard that the first time, they had no doubt in their mind as to what was meant by disciples because Jesus had explained it very clearly to them in Luke's Gospel in chapter 14. In Luke 14, when Jesus saw a great multitude of people coming along with him, we read in Luke 14 and verse 25, great multitudes were going along with Jesus and he turned and said to them some of the hardest words that he ever spoke to anyone. Now, most preachers and pastors, if they see a great crowd coming to listen to them, would never dream of speaking words like this. And there we see that Jesus was different. He was not interested in the numbers. Now, there are very few Christian preachers today who are not interested in numbers. And what you see in the subsequent verses till the end of Luke 14 is Jesus emphasizing quality. He wanted disciples. And so he turns around and tells them, if any of you 
come to me and you don't hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. It's not that you can be a second level of disciple, you just cannot be a disciple. So here we see the first condition of discipleship. The Bible says that we got to honor our father and mother. So what did Jesus mean when he said we got to hate? It's a relative statement. Jesus used some strong language sometimes like, if your right eye offends you, plug it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. If you don't eat my flesh and blood, you don't have eternal life. Many strong words. The words that he spoke was spirit and life. So what he meant here was that in comparison with our love for him, our love for our earthly relatives and brothers and sisters should be darkness compared to light. To use an illustration, if your love for your parents, wife, children, brothers, sisters is like the light of the stars, your love for Christ must be like the light of the sun. And when the sun comes up, the stars, as it were, become dark. They are there, but it's dark. So that's what it means here. Your hate means your love for your father and mother are almost invisible. It's you love them, but in the light of your love for Christ, which is like the bright shining sun, that is almost like darkness. It's like hatred as it were. And it also means that we should not allow our relatives or brothers or sisters to hinder us from following whatever the Lord may call us to do. So the first condition of discipleship is a supreme love for Christ, where we love Christ more than our parents, more than our wives, more than our children, more than every brother and sister in our blood relationship or within the church and our own life. Now, would you say that missionary work and evangelism has brought Christians to this place? You, every person who claims to be a born-again Christian, would you say that he has come to this place? Have you yourself, if you claim to be a born-again Christian, come to this place where you can say you love Christ supremely more than anyone on this earth? Well, in my observation of believers in many lands over these la this last half century, I don't find that to be true. They've accepted Christ. They sing, my sins are all forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. But they haven't become disciples. Second condition of discipleship is mentioned in verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, there's that absolute cannot. What does this mean to carry the cross every day? It says his own cross. I don't have to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't have to carry anybody else's cross. I have to carry my own cross. And in another passage in Luke 9 in verse 23, Jesus explained it like this, that if anyone wishes to come after me, Luke 9, 23, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There the word daily is added which applies here as well. So if we are to take up a cross every day of our life, our cross, and follow Christ, it must mean that Christ himself carried a cross daily. Otherwise, how could he ask me to follow him? Daily taking up my cross. So there was an inward cross in the life of the Lord Jesus all through those 33 and a half years, which culminated in a physical cross that he carried to Calvary. So we need to understand what this inward cross was, because if I don't take up that cross in my life, that same spirit that motivated and urged Jesus in his earthly life, I cannot be a disciple. Now today we don't use the word cross much because except it's become a the symbol of Christianity, people have golden crosses and ivory crosses and things like that. But in the day when Jesus spoke about it, it was the most horrible means of executing people that the Romans had invented. 
Today, something more appropriate would be the hangman's rope or the electric chair or something like that or the guillotine to be executed. So the cross was a symbol of execution of a man being hanged, put to death because he's a criminal. Only criminals were crucified. So here Jesus was speaking about something in us that had to be put to death every day if we are to follow him. What is that? And as we see in other places, Jesus spoke about our self-life. If anyone loves his own life, his self-life, he will lose it. So this is the cross that we have to take where our self is crucified every day. Or in other words, I say like in the words of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine. The strength of myself is found in my will. I want to do my will. I want to do what pleases me. This is the root of all sin. And if that is not put to death, I'm not taking up the cross. And we saw that that's got something that's to be done every single day. It's only then that I can be a disciple. In other words, every single day, I don't have to necessarily say those words, but I must have that attitude where I'm not going to do my will this day in any area, but I'm going to do the will of God. You know, it's one of the things that Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. You know, in heaven, none of the angels do their own will. They always wait upon God to see what God wants them to do. And that's what they do every single day in heaven. And if our days are to be like the days of heaven on earth, if our life is to be a heavenly life, here's the secret. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. In other words, my attitude to the Lord is, Lord, I never want to do my own will in anything. I don't want to marry whom I like. I don't want to take the job I like. I don't want to live where I like. I want to know what your will is in every single area. When somebody treats me badly, I want to react in the way you want me to react and not the way my flesh, my self-life wants to react. This is the meaning of taking up the cross every single day. And he says, if you don't do that, there's an absolute cannot be my disciple. So when Jesus said, as we were looking at the Great Commission, the other half of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, do you find that the believers you have met are walking in this way of taking up the cross every single day, dying to themselves every single day. Are you doing that yourself? And there you can see how little the commission given in Matthew 28 and verse 19 has been taken seriously by Christians. So the third condition for discipleship is in Luke 14 and verse 33. <clears throat> The first, as we saw, was to love Jesus more than all our relatives, friends, and anyone on earth. The second is to love Jesus above our own self-life and our own will. And the third is to love Jesus above all material things. Luke 14 and verse 33, where Jesus says, none of you, it's an absolute statement, no one of you can be my disciple. Luke 14, 33 who does not give up or forsake all his own possessions. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? We need to understand it. Does it mean we have to become hermits and sannyasis and go off into the jungles and live there, forsaking everything? Possessions refer to those things that possess us. My possession is what possesses me. If my house is my possession, I cling to it because it's mine. And I possess it, possess it and it possesses me. It could be an expensive car that you've got or very valuable stocks and shares. Uh, you possess them and they possess you because your mind is so much on those things. Your mind is not on the worthless things that you have in your home, but these very precious possessions. 
So what does it mean when it says that we have to give up our possessions if we are to be his disciple? Do I have to sell everything that I have? There was one particular young man who came to Jesus, we read in Mark 10, who indeed Jesus did tell him to sell all that he had. But Jesus never gave that command to everyone. Zacchaeus, for example, said to Jesus in Luke 19 that he would give away half his goods to the poor and, and uh, repay those whom he had cheated. And Jesus said, that's fine. He said, salvation has come to this house. He, he didn't demand of Zacchaeus that he should give up everything like the rich young ruler. In the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Jesus didn't even demand that they should give up anything. So he, his, he didn't tell everyone that they should sell everything. It's like cancer, you know, in some cases, a cancer is so widespread that a doctor says the only way you can be cured is by removing the entire organ. It could be some internal organ that's cancerous and the doctor says there's no other way. You got to remove the whole organ otherwise you'll die. But in some cases the cancer will not spread so much and they need to cut out just a little bit. So the love of money is like a cancer. In the case of that rich young ruler, it had spread so much that the Lord had to tell him, you got to sell all that you have, give it to the poor. But in the case of others, in Zacchaeus, it was less. And in the case of Mary and Martha, it was much less. So he didn't give that same command to everyone. It depends on how much the love of money has gripped you, how widespread that cancer is in your life that determines how much the Lord will tell you to actually give up and sell your possessions. But this attitude of Forsaking what we have is understood perhaps best by thinking of the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham possessed Isaac as his own. He, he loved him and he possessed him and he was the darling of his heart. He cared more for him than even for his wife. And God saw that Isaac was a little idol in Abraham's heart. Isaac was actually Abraham's God. He loved him so much and God wanted to detach him from that idolatry of possessing Isaac. So he said, take him to Mount Moriah and kill him. Get rid of him. And Abraham obeyed. God gave him three days to think about it. And so he walked all the way. It took three days for him to reach Mount Moriah. And he said, yes, Lord, I worship you. I offer Isaac up to you. But as he took the knife to slay Isaac, God said, stop, take him home. So from that day onwards, we can say, Abraham did not possess Isaac, but he had him. He was still in his house. He was still in his son. He was still his son. He wasn't dead, but he never possessed him. And that's a very beautiful picture of what it means to forsake our possessions. Think of the things that are most valuable, earthly things, material things that you have in your life. What are the things that you value, which are very, very, very important for you? Perhaps you should make a list of them. Those are your possessions. And you've got to be very honest. If you want to really be a disciple, you've got to be honest about what your possessions really are. And then you must decide, am I willing to stop having a possessive attitude to these things? It's like, you know, possession would be when you hold on to something tight. For example, if I hold this pen tight in my hand, I'm possessing it. It could be your house, it could be your bank account, it could be your stocks and shares, it could be your car, it could be anything valuable that you have, property, real estate. To have it means you open your palm and it's still there. It's still in your palm, you haven't given it up to somebody else. But you say, Lord, I recognize this is not something that's mine, it's yours. You've given it to me and I'm a steward and I want to be, use it faithfully, but I'm not going to be possessive about it. This doesn't possess me. I have it. Thank you for allowing me to have it. So this is the difference between possessing and having. And it says here that I must forsake all my possessions. 
I can still have many things that the Lord gives back to me and I can use them, but I no longer possess them. So the third condition of discipleship is that I love Jesus more than all earthly things. So here we have the three conditions of discipleship in Luke 14. First, to love Christ more than anyone and any human being on this earth. Whom have I on heaven but thee? And there's nothing and no one I desire on earth more than you. That's Psalm 73 and verse 25. This is the confession of a true disciple. I do not desire anyone on earth more than Christ. Psalm 73, 25. The second condition of discipleship is, I want to love Christ more than my own will and my own choice. Lord, I don't desire my choice in any matter. I want your will in every single area of my life. How I am to spend my time, my money, my energy, my life, my ambitions, my future is all laid at the feet of Jesus. And the third condition is that, to, that I don't possess anything, that everything on earth I will hold loosely. Christ means more to me than all those things. If the Lord takes away some of those things or I lose some of those things, I say like Job said in Job chapter 1, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is the attitude of a true disciple. Now, if a person does not fulfill these three conditions of discipleship, according to Luke 14, he's not a disciple. So when Jesus told his apostles to go into every nation, Matthew 28, 19, go into every single nation and make disciples, he meant that you got to bring people not only to the place where they know Christ as the forgiver of their sins, but as their Lord. That means he is, we love him more than anyone on earth, more than our own life, more than our own will, and more than all the things we possess on earth. He means more to us than all of that. Now, would you say that Christian missionaries and evangelists who preach the gospel have fulfilled that second half of the Great Commission? I would say no. Do you see why I use that illustration of 99% fulfilling just Mark 16, 15, and 1% fulfilling Matthew 28, 19, and 20. 99 people holding one end of the log and one person holding up the other end of the log. That's why I found that the Lord called me to go and help the people or the one person who's holding up the one end of the log. I believe that's a great need today. And this is also the reason why Christianity has got such a bad testimony in so many nations. And all of us know how born-again Christians have brought such disgrace to the name of the Lord. Why is it? Because they've just been brought to conversion. They've not been brought to discipleship. They've not been brought to giving up their own will or being detached from the things they possess. And therefore, the end result is, like Jesus said in Luke 14, they are like people who have laid a foundation. Luke 14, in the middle of this whole section on discipleship, Jesus speaks about a man who wants to build a tower. That's a picture of the entire Christian life. And by the time he finishes the foundation, it says he doesn't have enough to complete it. And the meaning is, if you see it in the context of these three conditions of discipleship, he's not willing to complete the tower by paying the price. Maybe he has the money, but he says, no, I don't want to complete it. So, the foundation is our sins being forgiven and I've received the Holy Spirit. I'm a child of God. Is that all there is to the Christian life? It has to be a tower, according to what Jesus said. And such a person who does not complete the tower is the object of ridicule, it says in verse 29. And the angels in heaven are amazed at Christians who just lay a foundation in their Christian life and imagine that that is Christianity. So that's why it's very important for us to emphasize and understand 
what it says here in Matthew 28 and verse 19, that we must go into every nation and make disciples. Whichever nation you are in today, if you are preaching, you should be making disciples. I want to say one more thing before I conclude, and that is, it is in connection with this that Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. If you do this, go into all nations, make disciples, I'll be with you always. How can people lay claim to that promise without fulfilling the condition? What a wonderful assurance it is. I determined to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. The Lord will be with me always. So let's have a brief prayer. Our Heavenly Father, help us to understand this in our life so that we examine our own lives and be disciples ourselves first and where we have the responsibility to preach, to make disciples of others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.